Um, okay, so you can see on Moodle's site there is a request to do course evaluation. People have suggested we get you to do them in class, but I'm just going to ask you to do it at some point because not everybody has the computer with them. So just uh, go onto the Moodle site, click on and do it for the, I can't do it. <laughs> it's like, I shouldn't be able to do course evaluations. Oh, I guess I can. How about that? Oh, it just tells me which ones are available. Uh, so nobody's, nobody's done the uh, 30, 40. So if, if you would, before now and April 6th. So I don't know if you if you noticed last night or not, but I put the I put both the obviously the film and the bullet points on for Marcuse. The interesting thing about Marcuse is there's a real overlap with Marcuse and Heidegger. And for the Marcuse conference, I'm going to be looking at the overlap between Marcuse and Heidegger in technology, which actually leads into Virilio, um, if our panel's accepted, which is a is a panel on Marcuse and Heidegger. So just to draw your attention to the bullet points that are there, the Marcuse, um, I'll put the film on it, and then we can screw it. And before we start, I want to check some things out. I better fit to screen because I've got, I don't have a um, way of taking it, or way of keeping time. That's in Liverpool. That's a train. That's a train station in Liverpool. So before I start, let me ask you guys: um, Are you good on your papers and stuff? What's the due date? I'm sorry. What's the due date? Yeah, what's the due date? What is the due date? Do you know what the is the first due date is for something? Let me take a look. It should be on the syllabus. <coughs> it's on the course. So basically, I mean, you know this because. But if you go to the um, syllabus that's on the course outline, it'll tell you. Let me just take a look. So the due date is April 1 to April 18th. Classes, we have one more class after this and then classes are over. Are you able to do the 18th? Because I think the problem is I have to have, because we don't have an exam, I have to have the grades in before the end of So the 18th works really well. What I'll do is I'll open an assignment on the Moodle site so you can upload it there. Yeah? Wait, you don't have an exam in the fall? No. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, did you not check the course outline? I checked it, but. I mean, it's all there. You know, discussion form 10%, concept paper 15%, first film 6%, concept paper 235%, second film two minutes 10%, seminar presentations 14, and seminar discussion 10. So, um, no. Cool. Are you okay with that? No, that's great. I'm just an idiot. That's my No, <clears throat> no, you're not an idiot at all. You just didn't check the course outline. Why should you until you need to find something out, right? So, yeah, no, I, I gave up doing exams quite a while ago. I didn't find them particularly very productive um, for myself or anybody else involved. So, and, and I got tired of reading answers to the same, like, I don't know, I just got tired of reading answers to similar questions. Like, my questions would be different each year, but they, you know, like, they, they, they circulate around, right? And it also is an upper level course. So, I think maybe you need exams in first and second year courses, but I don't actually think you need exams in third and fourth year. Well, I haven't had them for years, and I've been much happier. Um, if, if the, everybody's okay with that, right? Good. So we're going to look at Marcuse, and I want to do a, a few things with this. So Marcuse, and there's a Marcuse conference happening here next year. Marcuse really is one of the sort of more radical, political, 
um, but they threw him out. And he also has influenced a lot of people that are incredibly radical. So, so in a sense, Marcuse coming out of the Frankfurt School was the theorist who believed in revolution and was uh, Angela Davis, not Angela Davis, who was a free man, which is kind of awesome as well as influenced the student movement quite a bit in the 60s and 70s, uh, and, and really presented a, a sort of new, new thought up until when he died in 1979. He was a student of Heidegger's, and he spoke, his first, um, his first piece he wrote on Hegel, he really thanked Heidegger in it. So he, his, what you've read today is an early piece. You know, every time I think I get rid of something that's cold, it's like it starts again. I'm just like, really? But I, I just push up. So the piece you read today was written in 1941. It was written in America in 1941. Marcuse had left Germany. Marcuse was Jewish. The some social implications of modern technology. Then I think and I will argue on the paper I'm doing, it's very similar to Heidegger's, Heidegger's essay, The Question Concerning Technology, and it's really unclear to me who thought the ideas up first. I think there's an overlap, and, and one of my friends said to me, well, you know, they also are not that different from the understanding of technology at the time. I think they are. But he argued they didn't. So Heidegger's, the first, where Heidegger, what became The Question Concerning Technology that we did last week, it was written in 1949, but leading up to that, he'd been thinking about the ideas and presenting on the ideas prior to that. Then the one, <coughs> sorry, the one you read is written in 1950. Marcuse, this was written in 1941. So it's hard to tell who influenced who. I think they have a loop going on where they influence, each of them influenced the other. Would probably be the best, the best way of seeing that. What Marcuse is doing developing ideas on technology, I'll say, from his interaction with Heidegger and his understanding of technology and labor through Marx. And in a way, even though it was written before Heidegger's piece, I don't know if the ideas predated Heidegger's piece, but definitely the essay was written before Heidegger's piece. I would say that, that he contemporizes um, Heidegger's distinction between enslaving and police was. So he contemporizes this. Even though it was written before. And if you've read any other Marcuse, has anybody here read other Marcuse classes? Okay, so if you've read any other Marcuse, you'll see this is, I, this is one of my favorite pieces because it's all there in a nutshell. He develops it much more in One Dimensional Man, for example, which he wrote in 64. So, so 20 some years later, he writes One Dimensional Man. You also see it, you see traces of this in Eros and Civilization, his book on Freud. But I think the early essay, Some Social Implications of Modern Technology, in my read, is more seductive than the later text because it's fast. So you've got all the points there. And I like fast theory. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is three, well, two things. I'm going to, in a sense, review Heidegger's positioning of two, the two technological tendencies, in framing and polices. Show how Marcuse develops these two tendencies. And then next week, I'm going to show the relationship between Marcuse and Virilio, because we're going to end with Virilio. Well, actually, we'll end with Nietzsche, but it's Virilio and Nietzsche. So just to remind you from last, from last week, Heidegger posits two conflicting tendencies in technology. The dominant one of inframing, which is based on instrumental, what Marcuse is going to call instrumental rationality. It's the danger in technology. Instrumental technology, it's based on control. It's a, it's a way of thought because I mean both Marcuse and Heidegger see technology. Heidegger says it's it's a 
technique, technique, but it's also a way of thinking, a mode, and for, and for Marcuse, it's a mode, almost, it's a mode of production, but it's a way of thinking for Heidegger. And the way of thinking, in terms of his framing, is in terms of domination and control. And that's, the, they're both looking at that particular type of technology because they're writing in the 40s, because they're seeing specifically Nazi technology, and Marcuse is going to talk about it. And it's this technology that then comes to the fore as corporate techno-scientific technology and techno-war economies. Marcuse argues that. And the second tendency, of course, is poesis, which is which is revealing a particular type of revealing. It's the saving power. It's what's considered bringing forth as opposed to in framing, which is the danger, which is the instrumental, which is challenging forth. So there are very different ways of thinking technology between in framing and poesis between the saving potential inherent in technology and the dangerous potential. So in framing, just to recap from last week, it's a mode of revealing which challenges for. And what it does is it, it really, humans think in a certain way for this. They think in terms of ordering, controlling, dominating. And what it conceals is the other potential, which is the saving power, which is poesis conceals an older, if you go back to Heidegger, a former way of revealing that he traces back to ancient Greece that is a bringing forth. Now both Heidegger and Marcuse say the threat of technology is much deeper than the apparatuses of technology, than the machines of technology. The threat is that humans think in a certain way that they're denied this possibility to enter into more original revealing, that they think not in terms of poesis, but they think in terms of in framing. So Heidegger, on page 32 from last week, says, so long as we represent technology as an instrument, then we're held fast in its will to master. But in technology, there's this possibility of a saving power. And remember for Heidegger, it's not human activity and human achievement that's going to counter in framing as a way of revealing. Rather, it's human reflection. So both Marcuse and Heidegger have a concept of critical thinking. So what does Marcuse say? Well, he starts out on page 138, the very first page, and he says, he, he really presents a technological version of Marx's understanding labor, of, of labor. So at the very bottom of 138, he talks about technology being a social process. He talks about the means of production and the mode of production. He says, technology is taken as a social process. And he makes a distinction there between technology and what he calls techniques. This becomes important. So technology is a social process which techniques, that's a technical apparatus of industry, transportation, communication, is only a partial factor. And he says, we don't ask for the influence or effect of technology on human individuals because they're an integral and important factor of technology. Not just the people that invent technology, but the mass population. The social groups which direct its, its um, application and its utilization. Now techniques, is a technical apparatus of industry, 
transportation communication. And it can either promote authoritarianism or liberty, scarcity as well as abundance. He makes this distinction between techniques and technology. So the techniques is the technological apparatus of industry, transportation, communication. You then have humans, <coughs> which are a really integral part, a factor of technology, is the volume 138. Humans invented technology, they attend to it. They are social groups with direct its application and use. And then on 139, he makes a distinction between techniques and technology. So techniques, the technical aspect of industry, transportation, and communication, is similar to what Heidegger calls techne, in terms of skill and knowledge. And it can either promote authoritarianism or it can promote liberty. It can promote scarcity as well as abundance. It can abolish or extend work. Technology, as well as being machines and instruments, is really a way, a mode, he says on 39, of organizing and perpetuating or changing social relationships. It's a manifestation of prevalent thought, and that's in the second big paragraph there. It's a manifestation of prevalent thought and behavior and an instrument for control and domination. It's a way of thinking, it's a way of doing, It's a way of organizing one's relationship to other human beings, to the product of your labor, to the labor process itself. So he's using a Marxist analysis there. And what he leaves is a messianic hope for a liberatory potential in technology, much like Marcuse does. So he leaves this hope for poesis. It's going to be there in thought and behavior. It's what, it's what Heidegger calls human reflection Marcuse calls it critical thought, and he couples it with action. So just to recap Marcuse's concept of technology, it's a, it's a social process, it's a mode of production, where you have the instruments, the devices, the contrivances that characterize the machine age, and it's a mode of organizing social relationships. Techniques, on the other hand, is, it fits into technology, but it can also organize it in a different way. Which allows him then to make this, so tech, just 139, techniques can promote authoritarianism as well as liberty. And then it allows him to take a look at the distinction between what he calls terrorist technology of fascist war economy. And the war economy. And then he says they're much like Schmidt, he says that the war economy is not an exception. Rather, it's the technology that's been in existence that's given rise to this. He says, national socialism is a striking example of the ways in which a highly rationalized and mechanized economy with the utmost efficiency in production can operate in the interests of totalitarian oppression and continued scarcity. The Third Reich he sees as a form of technology, a form of te technocracy. The technical considerations of imperialist efficiency and rationality supersede the traditional standards of profitability and general warfare, welfare. So it's a reign of terror. However, he says at the bottom of that paragraph, this terroristic technocrat technocracy cannot be attributed to the exception it's a requirement of the war economy. But the war economy really is the normal state of the national socialist ordering of the social and economic process. And technology is one of the chief ways of organizing it. So what he's saying there, basically, is that, is that technology, as you see it, and it's precisely the technology that, that Heidegger is talking about, but as you see technology in the nationalist, national socialist regime, it's a war technology that is, but, but it's give, been given rise to by the technology of instrumentalization that's been used during the peacetime. 
It's a, a technology of efficiency. It's a way of thinking of efficiency and control and that's then fed into making technology of the war economy. So what he's doing is he's saying, okay, we can't think of this as an exception because it's going to recur again. And it's going to recur again in the American context next. And it's going to occur as part of imperialism. So in a sense, he's saying that there's particular types of techniques that lead towards a war economy that's gone to the extreme in, in um, national socialism, but basically the techniques are there. They've been developed. And so the techniques would be efficiency, instrumentalism, a particular way of thinking with sacrifice of the individual for a mass collective. And he's writing this in 1941. So he's saying the, the, the normal state of national socialist ordering of the social and economic process is evident in the technology, the technology of making trains run on time, gas chambers, um, the technology of mass production, the military technology that's used to fight against the population and external populations. What he lists there is he lists intensification of labor, propaganda, training bureaucracy, this is all part of the particular techniques that go into creating that type of type of technology. He's arguing then, and this is a really important argument for Marcuse, because he's grounded in Marxism. So he's saying domination perpetuates and extends itself as technology. It extends itself as a mode of production. It extends itself as social forces. It's right there when you look at a war economy um, in the means of production themselves. And what you end up with then is the instrumentalization of the human. And he gives an example, which is a really interesting example, when he talks about the highway. So he talks about, and it's a really, mind, it's, it's nothing bad or anything, but he says, and if you haven't read it, it's a 143. It's a way of thinking. It's, a, it's an attitude that comes out of the Enlightenment and then turns on the Enlightenment. It produces a new rationality and a new type of individual. So he says it's a simple example. Let's take a simple example. Middle, par middle paragraph of 143. A man who travels by automobile to a distant place chooses his route from highway maps. Towns, lakes, mountains appear as obstacles to be bypassed. The countryside is shaped and organized by the highway. Numerous signs and posters tell the driver what to do and think. They even request his attention to the beauties of nature or the hallmarks of history. Others have done the thinking for him, and perhaps for the better. Convenient parking spaces have been constructed where the broadest and most surprising view is open. Giant advertisements tell him when to stop and find the pause and re that refreshes. And all this is indeed for his benefit, safety, and comfort. He receives what he wants. Business techniques, human needs, and nature are welded together into one rational and expedient mechanism. So you think, oh, that's okay, like who looks at maps anymore, right? And you also think, you know, okay, so you plug in, I usually use Waze, so you plug in Waze, um, you know, and you can get it on the radio if you've got a new enough car, so rentals usually have that. And then you don't actually have to at all plan your route. Not only that, you don't really have to watch out for obstructions, because it will tell you if there's an obstruction up ahead. So basically, in a sense, what Marcuse is talking about there is simply in terms of roadmaps and like the most efficient way of getting there has been intensified extremely. And, and it's that particular way of thinking in relation to the environment, which is an instrumental, an instrumental way of how one passes through. Um, and so you, mean, you think like, I don't know, you pro guys probably didn't do this, but hey, I grew up in a farm years ago, and like Sunday you'd go out like for a Sunday drive and just like drive around, which was kind of boring, but kind of interesting, and kind of boring, kind of interesting, right? you just drive around. Um, and you'd end up at somebody's place, and it was interesting, you know, if somebody turns up at my place, I'm not particularly glad to see them, and I'm just like, oh, I'm really busy. Um, but you'd end up at somebody's place, and they'd be really glad to see you, because face it, they weren't really doing anything either, right? 
So that, I mean, they were, you know, Sunny was a damn breast or anything, but there's a different way. Or if you think like on foot, like, I don't know, but sometimes, you know, I just go get lost when I'm traveling and just walk around because if you spend all your time trying to navigate either using, you know, ways or using a map, you're missing all the stuff that's going on. And you're also being directed, and this is what Marcuse has pointed, you're also being directed precisely to what somebody else thought was really interesting. You know? And so Marcuse is saying, well, partly what happens is our ability to critically decide and think and appreciate the poetics of something disappears. And we're left what we're left with this sort of, you know, mass way, mass way of traveling, and we're left with, you know, entertainment um, rather than sort of interaction with what's there. And this new type of rationality and new type of individuality cuts down on the poesis of being able to critically reflect. And it, it, it goes together with a new technological process. So for Marcuse, it's always intimately linked with the process itself. It's always intimately linked with the mode of production, the social relations of the mode of production, what they and, and the means of production used, which of course are produced by humans. So it's a circular link. What happens then is this individualist rationality ends up being transformed into what we see today, and there probably has to be a new term for it today. Um, so from Arcusa, it gets transformed into technological rationality. But I think we need a new term for it, and I'm not sure what it is. Because I mean, technological rationality still exists, but it's also digital technological rationality is one aspect of it. I don't think that I don't think that just qualifier is important enough. But I think if you go, I mean, I think we think differently, and partly it's because we think digitally. So what he says in One Dimensional Man is that this very rationality of technology, the scientific rationality, quote, makes for a special science. So, societal organization because it projects form and functionalism, which then allows him to say or to claim that instrumental thought and control are there in technology, they're a priorities of technology, of modern technology where techniques is formed a certain way. So both Heidegger and Marcuse make a distinction between modern technology and technology itself. Marcuse, in a sense, does it through framing and poesis. Sorry, Heidegger does it through framing and poesis. Marcuse does it in terms of technique. We've got possibility where the technology can be used in different ways. And you've got the same type of technology. So for Marcuse, he says domination, and it's not in this article, it's in One Dimensional Man. He says domination, but it, it's developed from this article. Domination perpetuates and extends itself, not only through technology, but as technology itself. That basically, the technology that we engage with is technological domination. It's technological domination in terms of our social relations to others, in terms of our relation to the product we're doing. And he's thinking of Taylorism, for example, there. He's thinking of mass production. He's thinking of, has anybody here worked on assembly lines or no? Okay. So yeah, so in a sense, it, it ends up, you think in a certain way, which is partially to get to the end product, because you're responsible for something. Um, and there's a speed up on it, there's jobs that become redundant, there's the most efficient way of doing it, there isn't a craft there. That's all part of the domination that's contained in modern technology. So remember for Heidegger, it's, a re it's reflection that can bring this saving power of technology. It can break the power of inframing. He says towards, Heidegger says towards the end of the question concerning technology, so long as we represent technology as an instrument, we, may, we, we 
remain transfixed in its will to master. At the time Marcuse is writing, and he's in America, um, and what I think happened is I think Heidegger had these ideas early on, and if you trace if you trace through some of his work, he had his ideas on technology early on. He jotted some down. He didn't really develop them until later on, but he probably used them in his lectures. Marcuse probably was informed by some of them and then went his own route, bringing together Heidegger and Marx. And so in that sense, his, his is a combination. It comes out before Heidegger's, and when you go back and look at Heidegger's, you go, did Heidegger copy Marcuse? And I don't know. Yeah, Jordan. I was going to say, just because you're so heavily influenced by Marx, I haven't read it any much on the authors. Um, Heidegger yeah. isn't, but Marcuse okay, is. So That's for, the big distinction. So for Marcuse, does he ever bring up the connection with um, the universally developed individual in Marx and the all-sidedness in his production? Because that would be something where there's this idea teleologically that people are able to do every task and do it efficiently because they're self-sufficient rather yeah. than the technology. Yeah. You know, As doing you know, things for them. So it's, it's interesting he, you ask that because he does. He doesn't talk about the, the universal individual in a sense that can do everything, but he talks about the change from individuality and being an individual and becoming part of a mass. And then later on, in One Dimensional Man, he does talk about that. And in an essay on liberation, he talks about how we are now biologically dominated, so we no longer have that ability. Okay, so we have to stop this sort of biosocial bio domination. But what's interesting is because as long as you're an individual and a craftsperson, um, you're able to do a number of different tasks, right? And so you've got an idea of a completion and a totality. Um, when you become part of mass production and become part of the mass and the crowd, you both lose this, and, and I think I know where you're going with that, which is really interesting, you, you lose this universal ability to see a totality, because I mean, Marcuse is a, a totalizing thinker, and so is Heidegger. Yeah. You lose this ability to see a totality, and what's lost as part of that, because of the work you're doing, but what's lost as part of that is any much room for critical reflection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you can't see anything either than the fragmentation of what you're doing and how you're living. And because you've been so absorbed by the technological apparatus that you're thinking that way. Okay, so then what you really find, you, you find that change in education itself, right? So would he, like, in the social sense, be, like, considered, like, I don't know what his ideological leanings are, then what it seems to me what he's implying is that in this ideal society that it'd be more, like, libertarian, right? Where everybody's producing in their own means rather than probably not organizing it for you? you know no, I mean? he's probably more of a, I mean, he could be a left libertarian, but I would say he's more of a socialist. Yeah. I would more, he's more of a social democrat. Okay. Marcuse doesn't really get much beyond the social democrat. Well, holding to different principles of societal organization that are not based on scarcity, but rather on abundance. Because mm -hmm. his argument always is, is there's abundance there. Mm -hmm. it, just gets, it just gets eaten up in terms of the standing reserve, right? Yeah. Um, so in that sense, and, and basically the student groups and the groups that use Marcuse were social movements. So I mean, Marcuse is also very much um, part of sort of a collective, collective thinking. Mm -hmm. Partly because, but a collective thinking that's able to critically reflect. And but what's happening, he says, in terms of what you initially asked, is that the individuality hasn't disappeared and it's on page 142, but rather it's developed into the object of large scale organization and coordination. And then individual achievement has been transformed into standard efficiency. And he says the latter is characterized by the fact that the individual's performance is motivated, guided, and measured by standards external to it, standards of production, standards pertaining to predetermined tasks and functions. So the Marxist idea of the, the individual who can do all these things is, is really what's driving his critique of this individuality. Yeah, that's what I figured. That's yeah. what I was getting from it. It's just kind of hard to see because on one sense it seems paradoxical when you talk about technology not being used instrumentally and not having this power over you, so you have to develop the skills and abilities to be able to kind of be able to be critical and outside of the domination of technology, right. but at the same time, if you have a socialist society, you have to have a collective way of production. Absolutely, and he's not opposed to that. 
because his out, what he leaves, is how techniques itself can be organized. Mm -hmm. It can either be organized as domination or as useful to people using it. Oh, okay. So, that's, so that's where his out is, right? So it's an out like poesis for Heidegger techniques. If you go back to when he first defines it, on page 139, it can promote authoritarianism as well as liberty. You know, he goes through that. And it's a way of organizing the technology. So that becomes, that, that's really important for him. And then it, he, he takes that even further when he goes on like 20 years later in One Dimensional Man. Uh, yeah. So what's his stance on like automation and stuff like that? Same problem. Um, it, is it, too, it would be twofold, and it's a very good question. I'm blanking on your name. Peter. Peter. Okay, it's a very good question because automation itself is embedded in a particular way of, of relating, right? On the other hand, if it's used so people have a shorter work day and it's used for the betterment of like, you know, the, the mode of, if it's used for the betterment of the people living in that mode of production, then it would be okay. But if, if it's not, I mean, because yes, you're gonna have to have automation, right? And it's not, that's why techniques is so important for him. It, it's not crucial that automation always operate as authoritarian. Okay, that it can operate is, you know, like, and you've also worked places where you've had some control over, like, what you're doing. Um, I'm trying to think if I ever have, not really. Uh, but if you have, where you decide, okay, I mean, this, I know this not from anything I've done, but from what they've tried to do in Mozambique. Of course, Mozambique just got hit so hard after the revolution by, you know, forces coming in from South Africa, because it was still apartheid. And also, like, p the population being killed, and they got hit by no money, et cetera. But what they tried to do was really to have factories where people working there set their production quotas, set how they were going to do, and they rotated around and worked in different areas on stuff. And I mean, that would be, Marcuse would be good with that in terms of an apparatus, because it's not, it's not all about making you fit into the, the technology itself, but you're working in relation to it. So I mean, if you think about it now, um, if you think about it in terms of, I don't know, I was gonna say like, if you're working as an independent and you're working on sort of a digital project, I mean, you've got that, right? Like, so if you're working as on a collective, like one of the, uh, one of the artist designers that I know and is sort of a friend, is they're working uh, for an organization where they help companies think about how to use their technology differently more beneficial, but to have it so that people have more autonomy in using it, right? And I think that works, I mean, that can work very well. Um, you know, so if you're, because I mean, for Marcuse, ideally, he would like probably to see an individual have a life such as where they're doing a number of different related, but jobs, so they can see the, the end of it. Like, you know, I mean, he was a prof, was how he made most of his money, then he made a lot from his books. So if you're writing, you can see the end of your writing. If you're teaching, you can see the end of the lecture. You know, you can see the end of a term. You can see the end of something. It's just not constantly like a loop through. And you can say, okay, well, you know, in his case, I taught Angela Davis, and look, she's running, she's like leading a revolution right now, and now she's in jail, right? Like, I mean, there's, there's a whole, I mean, he was instrumental also in, in her getting up. I believe, if I remember correctly, she's, I mean, she's awesome. She's been out of jail for a long time. She does amazing stuff with kids, right? So, um, in that sense, you know, that's the model, and, and remember, he's also using a romantic model of what life was like in Germany around the academy and in society prior to the Nazification. And for Marcuse, the na National Socialism, you know, brought a particular type of war economy and grounded it right through society. And it was based on these techniques of like efficiency, um, control, uh, you know, domination, like all of the ones that he's critiquing. Yeah, Patrick. Um, yeah, I just have sort of a problem understanding, because at one point he's talking about, like on 151 he talks about, um, like restraining individuals within a range of individuality in relation to technology. So, right. like, you know, figuring out someone's aptitude and then figuring out where they would fit in the technological apparatus. Yeah. Um, and he says that helps preserve individuality to a certain extent, and then he still has a problem with it, and I don't really get this. The problem? Yeah. Well, I guess because then you just end up being like, you know, what's the one that Nietzsche has where it's like the person with the big ear? Because that's all they can, like, do you, I mean, sometimes Nietzsche's, 
to form bodies or because that's the only activity they do. Wasn't that a, a critique on Wagner? Because <laughs> he was a, he was a the, the great musician, you know, and he that's did music all, all but that's apparently what he thought. And he ran was. off with uh, Nietzsche's love, love of Nietzsche's life, so that's a problem. Yeah. Yes, it probably was. I didn't think of that, but yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I, and once you said that, I'm like, yeah. So <laughs> where where is this on 151? Because I'm just um, on 151. Can you just point me to it? That page is kind of like one giant paragraph. But You're right. Talks about it, um, He's got specialization fixates the prevailing scheme of standardization. Almost everyone has become a potential member of the crowd. He's making a real distinction between individual becoming part of the crowd and the mass. Um, just that, that's an aside, not to what you said, but just to say, to say um, as such, they can easily be handled for their thoughts, feelings, and interests of, of their members have been assimilated into a pattern of the apparatus. So he's like, so he's arguing there, what he argues in this amazing book called Dialect of Enlightenment, he argues that basically the entertainment industry has been very influential in sucking us in, at that point, into a particular way of thinking, a mass way of thinking, without critical reflection. Yeah, yeah. just in the sentence right before that, he's talking okay. about how um, specialists like it preserves a certain range of individuality. Within this range of individuality, is not only preserved, but also fostered and rewarded. Right. But such individuality is only the special form in which man intercepts and discharges within a general pattern certain duties allocated to him. So he's saying it's not the individuality that used to exist. It's a particular type of individuality that's hooked to uh, the technological apparatus. So if you take a look what he says about individuality before that, uh, if you go back to 142, and he's talking about how individuality that was assumed in the Enlightenment Comes then an individuality that's so the indi so you go back to Kant because he's influenced by Kant too, and the idea that you know somebody who can think for themselves is the individual is the enlightened individual. Well, what Marcuse is arguing is this, en this enlightened type of individual that is now subject to crowd thought. Okay, is now subject to uh, mass thought. And 151, he's saying, okay, if there is an individual, before that, 140, was it 142, he says there's an individual, but it's an individual that is not what was the idea of an individual in the Enlightenment. He says it's not disappeared, but it's developed into the object of large scale organization and coordination. An individual achievement has been transformed into standardized efficiency. So then, if you take that through to 151, where he says, within this range, individuality is not only preserved, but fostered and rewarded. But such individuality is only the special form in which a man intercepts and discharges within a general pattern certain duties allocated to him. And then he goes into specialization. So it's a great question because it, it really hits on one of the things that Marcuse talks about again and again, is how the way in individuality is like dare to know the individual. Um, dare to be responsible for yourself gets changed as someone who fits into and and does as part of the machine. Like you're still an individual, but you're you're now an individual that fits into this. Does that make sense or no? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What that book you said was the dialogue of enlightenment. Oh, dialogue of enlightenment is the, actually that was the first book I read that I really could not understand. <laughs> Um, and I read it with a, a very, somebody who became a very well-known theorist, Arthur Crocombe. And um, I was a very strong, well, I thought I was a very strong Trotskyist at the time, so I was like feeding everything through, through this. It, that didn't last particularly long. But um, what was interesting is I could not get the nuances of what Marcuse was saying. And it was written, <clears throat> sorry, it was written in Horkheimer and Adornal. So it, it, the book is Horkheimer and Adornal, Dialect of Enlightenment. There's a chapter there on, um, the mass entertainment industry that then Marcuse picks up and writes about again and again. And the mass entertainment industry is basically ends up creating a crowd, their argument is. And I mean, they're a little bit, I mean, the thing is they're also snobs, right? Because they're really coming from German intelligentsia. And they, they are a little bit snobs on that, but they're saying mass entertainment really ends up creating a, cr a crowd way of thinking. And Marcuse picks them. Now, you know what? I kind of really liked Logan, um, <laughs> for example, and and I don't think I don't think.
think it, I thought it was kind of critical. Um, I don't think it affected my ability to critically think. So I think there's a problem with that argument. I, I think that because that argument then sets up high and low culture. Okay, so if the entertainment industry becomes low culture, so if movies which are more readily available because they're cheaper, they used to be cheaper, now they're not so cheap, but then, but you can always, you know, pirate them, whatever, right? Or go to them. And, and, but the thing is, I don't necessarily think it creates people to think. You know, I'm a big fan of Fast and Furious, and I don't really think that I go around thinking all that much like them. But doesn't it have to do with kind of like this idea of techniques where you can view it and whether you're using it as a distraction or you're, or you're still in a moment That's a really thought, good point. That's know, a great like, point. Because you can watch these things and it doesn't necessarily mean it's low culture. It, like if, you're a, if, if you still have a mode of thinking, a way of living where you can still be critical nice. and it's not, just a, it's not just a distraction for you. Nice. And that's different, I, I would assume. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good argument. Yeah. Yes, Peter. I was gonna say, um, I agree with you, but if all you watch ever is Fast and Furious movies, then you're probably not gonna be a great critical. Film. Like if that's the only. Well, will I get to talk like you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're absolutely right. So you're saying if that's my way, if that's what I watch in terms of, I don't know, my culture. Like if that's your input, yeah. I'm yeah, not expecting right. much on the output. To be honest. <laughs> Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Yeah, but that would be like such an extreme, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's have true. to, you know, I, I, I... So what if you watch it while reading, like, philosophy and things like that? Yeah. And watching other independent films and going to plays, etc. Because that's what you're kind of suggesting. Yeah, I And mean, having an education and stuff, right? Just being a well-rounded person. Yeah. If you I agree. Know, then it'd be totally. a distracted type, I feel like. You'd be like, a, you know, you, you, I'm just going to distract myself. It's just entertainment. Right. Yeah. But then... It doesn't have any, like... But then, Peter, it's a good, I mean, it's a really important observation, but are there people that simply do that? Because I'm not convinced there are. I'm not convinced, I mean, I don't buy the whole argument that some people just, like, like you know, surf through life on, like, this level of, like, mm. fast and furious. I mean, not necessarily <laughs> fast and furious, <laughs> but I know some people who just do nothing but watch daytime television. Like, that's their only Jeez, that source really of input. Yeah. And there's a lot Are these young people or older people? <laughs> They're older people. But yeah, there's not a lot of variance in daytime show. television. So they don't end up with a lot of variety of different, like, conflicting yeah, right. opinions. Yeah, no, that's sad. You're at, I mean, yeah, okay, that's a problem because that's precisely, that, that's precisely what Marcuse is talking about in terms of mass entertainment and mass, and, and sort of, what would you call it? Controlling mass thinking just by, you know, giving you those, like, limited options. So you end up thinking like that, and then you go on. If you're using Twitter, you go on and you like just reproduce that. So that's a problem, Patrick. I think you had your hand up before. No. Oh no. Sorry. Okay. So uh, yes, right. and so I'm like blanking on your name. Sorry. Hamza. Hamza. Ah, Hamza. Okay. Yeah. To what he's saying, right? Just like in South Africa, there's someone who lives like Tarzan. Oh. Yeah, he lives in the jungle. Seriously. Climb trees, yeah. So there's the population. He basically lived like Tarzan because when he was growing up, the dad was like, the dad was into Tarzan. Movies, yes. comics, and all that. Then he grew up and like, you know what? I can be like this character. Like, I want to be like that. I don't know. So I guess he could do worse. That's kind of awesome in his own way. <laughs> so he's like self-sufficient? He's not hurting anybody? No. Good way to eat healthy. His main goal is to like, act in the movie Tarzan with that. Oh my god, that's interesting. So you're saying, okay, so he's so internalized that that particular aspect of mass culture. Oh wow, that's interesting. It's very interesting also that he chose someone who was like he chose a character who's relatively quite decent and capable and self sufficient. That's interesting. Does he also have Jane? No, Jane. Because I was going to say, there's bound to be somebody who would be like, hey, this is great. I think you should just advertise for like, you know. That's awesome, you know, odd way, but your point is really well taken, Hazam, because, yeah, I never thought people would go that extreme. It's wild. Okay, Stephen. Uh, again, go over it. But he said, I mean, when you made work, you all put away then as well as you sat around and we read Nietzsche all day. You yeah. have to lock yourself up. You wouldn't be able to talk to anyone around you. You're not a well rounded person then either, right? You might talk smarter, but you have nothing in common. So you could talk to 
other people who read Nietzsche all day. And if you're around a university, you'll find them. <laughs> right, but then you can talk to people who just watch Fast and Furious all day like that. It doesn't make you higher or lower. Good you point. Only know one thing still, right? Yeah, but there's a complete there's a complete fallacy in just saying one thing all the time because you have to like going back to the whole idea that this is an organizational logic. It's integrated in society as a whole, te technologically speaking, socially speaking. You can't just sit around and watch one movie all day. You're going to have to go out to survive, yeah. to eat something, find a way to get food, you talk probably, to some people. And not know. only that, you'll probably like reconstruct cars, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. You yeah. do like all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think Peter's point is really well taken, though. I think it was your point initially that you need a mix of all different things. Otherwise, you're just going to end up, and, and Stephen's point, too. I'm, I like the Tarzan example. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but Stephen's point too is it doesn't matter if it's like sort of what's considered low culture or if, you know it's a philosopher if that's all you do. So what happens if you read Marx all day and you interact with other people that read Marx all day and I don't know like then what? I mean you're still stuck in a bubble, right? You're not a well-rounded person. You're like an extreme that honestly probably can't exist, but you know, yeah, you get there. Yeah, that's interesting. Those are good examples. I just have to check the time here to make sure I'm gonna. I'm on schedule, yep, we're on schedule. So Marcuse, to go back to, I'm just gonna go back to page 144. I mean, at the time he's writing, and it's 41, okay, so you can imagine now, so he's saying, look, the technological apparatus is ever more ubiquitous, it's ever more everywhere, and now it's everywhere all the time, right? So everything cooperates, this is on page 144, it's a quote, Everything cooperates to turn human instincts, desires, and thoughts into channels that feed the apparatus. The relationship among humans are increasingly mediated by the machine process. So then you could say, that's interesting. What about like social media and technology today? Right? So in a sense, that feeds us into a particular way of thinking, acting, responding, observing, writing. Human behavior is outfitted with the rationality of the machine process. So these mechanics of conformity spread from the technological into the social order. And so they govern, they govern performance not only in factories and shops, but also in offices, schools, assemblies. And finally, Marcuse says, in relaxation and entertainment, and we talked about all that. But also think about schools. I mean, think about going to school. I mean, you've got a really You've got, unless you were lucky enough, your parents sent you to an art school or an alternative school. And if you did, you must be finding the university a little. But if they didn't, which they probably didn't, um, in that sense then, what you've got is a particular, you're taught a particular way to think. You're taught a particular, and you're also taught all these rules, like you can't have your technology on in school unless you think, all sorts of things. So what's taken away from you is this ability to be able to think critically yourself and go, okay, well, right now I have to do this. I'm in a lecture, but then I'll go back to like that kind of stuff. It ends up being taken, sort of taken away. And what also I think happens is it, it also governs our bodies. Marcuse then goes on to talk in, in the essay on liberation. It governs our bodies in a particular way. So we actually become regimented into ways of being in classes. Like, I don't know about you, but it's really hard for me, if I want to keep my attention going, to sit in one place for a periods of time. I mean, I talk with Lucas about this. Lucas is like, yeah, I need to move around. It's true, and a lot of schools don't let you move around. So by the time you get to university, then you're not used to moving around while you're listening to stuff, right? Even though, you know, with a number of us, it's fine. Um, so that kind of stuff just all gets a particular type of technology ingrained in the body. Marcuse says that the original truth, homogeneous truth, and I don't know what he means by that in a sense. He means like this, the original truth is split into two different sets of truth values and patterns of behavior. Because he tries to address two truth values and patterns of behavior. He's trying to get to the point where he says one is assimilated to the apparatus and the other one is antagonistic to it. So I'd be more happy if we, had, we said two different sort of thought patterns. But what he's really trying to say is that the, the standardization of thought that comes with technological rationality produces a particular type of truth value. And it's a truth value 
that doesn't question what exists, that inhibits reflection, that in a sense inhibits thought outside of what he calls technological rationality. And what he calls it in his later work, he refers to it because now, then he's influenced by Freud, right? So he, I mean, Marcuse is very much influenced by Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, and Heidegger and Hegel. So what he calls, in his later work, he calls it the reality principle of techno-capitalism. It's a reality principle of instrumental rationality, technological rationality, in which the irrational is seen as rational. Now if you go to page 149 of this article, As soon as they get out of order, it gets better. It gets really difficult. If you go to the top of, of 149, he says, the ever-growing strength of the apparatus is not the only influence possible, but there's a social imp impotence of critical thought that it's really hard to think critically in an apparatus that doesn't facilitate this. It doesn't give you that pause. Remember, that, um, Zizak talks about that sort of delay, the pause to think critically. So Marcuse, in 1941, says this, the, this impotence or inability of critical thought has been further facilitated by the fact that the important strata of the opposition, he's looking at the American Federation of Labor, have for a long time been incorporated into the apparatus itself without losing the title of opposition. So this history, the history of this process, he says, is well known, and you can see it in the labor movement. Um, and then he just goes, says, shortly after World War, the First World War, Veblen declared that the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, is itself one of the vested interests. So Marcuse is saying that, you know, labor unions, I had to, Labor unions are, are really there to hold capitalism, the workplace, in check. Once to go back to Sorel, they've been co-opted, co but they end up thinking not that critically. And the avenue then, if you see the opposition thinking the same this, as a person, if you see the op what's supposedly the opposition thinking pretty much the same, you end up with you know, thought that that even critical thought that's not different from dominant thought. Now what's interesting about the US right now, for the first time really, you can see a big difference between the way, within republicanism, the way certain republicans are thinking and other republicans are thinking, and also democrats are thinking. And you can see, you can see a difference, and some of it, I mean certainly the, the Bernie Sanders option, is critical thinking. And you can actually speak, you can see that play out often in American politics, and this is what Marcuse is referring to, there's not that much difference between Democrats and Republicans on issues. So you don't see particularly much critical reflection going on. And so if you, you know, so you have to go out, kind of outside of that. That's the escalators at Terminal 1, actually. And the other problem, he says, that when we do do critical thought, it, there's a problem in that it's powerless, often. And it's powerless for precisely the reason I read. The social, the, the social power of critical thought has been facilitated by the fact that important strata that used to engage in this, it's precisely what Sorrell is saying in terms of socialist parties, once they're in power, once they've been co-opted, think pretty much the same as the dominant groups. That they get incorporated into the apparatus themselves. So they may make demands which are important for better wages, but they're not going to make any demands that, that goes against the system. And they're still going to have the title of opposition. Then if you go, I want to take you to pages 150 and 151, because he says something very interesting there. Um, he's saying that the rationality of enterprises appear as objective rationality. So if you go back to Zizak here, because Zizak was influenced by Marcuse too, um, as were you know, many people, as in a sense, for people that lived through that time, we, we all kind of were. 
So Zizak basically says, you know, objective domination. That's a domination that's there that's part of the system that you don't even question. That's what Marcuse is talking about in terms of objective rationality. You know, so remember Zizak talks about subjective violence, um, objective violence, and symbolic violence. Symbolic violence and objective violence are embedded in the system itself. They're part of what Marcuse is calling objective rationality. And since Marcuse wrote this first, and certainly Zizak has read it, and is influenced by the same genealogy of thinkers as Marcuse, he's definitely picked up on it. So te in technological rationality, and we touched on this, the individual becomes a mass. Technological rationality for Marcuse turns the individual, the individual of the enlightenment of modernity, Kant's individual, that is a person who dares to know, can think for themselves, that in a sense the enlightenment is bringing them out of minor minoritarian thinking and allows them to think for themselves. Marcuse says this individual of the enlightenment is, is integrated into the crowd, into the masses, so on page 150, the second paragraph, he says, it seems to be self-evident that mass and individuals are contradictory concepts and incompatible facts. The crowd, in quotation marks, is to be sure composed of individuals, but of individuals who cease to be isolated, who cease thinking. So they're thinking like the mass. And then if you go to page 151, he talks about job training. He talks about job training in, in mechanized production top of the page there, and he says, vocational training, so I don't know if any of you have had vocational training at some point, or if you've done jobs that I certainly have, because if you do a job that needs manual dexterity, you get trained on that. That's what he means by vocational training. Now, I mean, albeit probably the stuff I had took two hours, but, but he's talking about vocational training is certainly training in various kinds of skills, psychology, physiological adaptation to a job which has to be done. So this is vocational training. And if, when I went to high school, I don't know about you guys, but, but there was a certain, it was called vocational. So there was like the regular kids, there was the smart kids, there was like the regular kids, and there was the vocational. And the vocational, were you a vocational kid? I know, because they kept completely, a lot of the vocational kids, if they managed to like break out of being a vocational kid, or were, were considered vocational kids, that's people that should be trained for, jobs where they, you know, learn vocational skills that, that Marcuse is critiquing here, were basically there because they were really bored with the whole educational system. It's not, yeah, because it was like really authoritarian, because they taught you to think in a certain way. I, of course, was not that critical, so I was in the go to university crowd, right? Um, it was only later that one became really critical. The problem, the problem is that the vocational is you end up channeling people that may never move to something else, even though they could be way better versed than the people that are doing like the, you know, I'm so smart, I'm going to university group. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, it pretty much cuts it. I was just put into a course that we were like, you have no idea what you're doing. So I just go ahead and build cars all day. That was pretty much what I had to do. So well, actually, building cars all day is not bad. It was fun, but <laughs> like, I didn't go to university, or even college, so I was like 23. So I had no idea I even could. So. That's a, yeah, okay, and then that's, real, that's a really good point. And most of the kids I went to school with originally from the smaller town I went to all were, because we're at a bigger town, put into vocational training. You know, so, and, and so basically Marcuse's nailed it in 41. Vocational training is chiefly training in various kinds of skill. Psycholo and it's psychological training, like this is what you can be good at. This is what you can do. It's physiological adaptation to a job, which has to be done. And the job itself is a pre-given type of work that requires a combination of abilities that are in relation to a machine that you will learn and take them as skills. Yeah. And then when he talks about mechanized mass production, he talks about mechanized mass production, because both he and Heidegger are talking about this, on page 158, the last paragraph there, he's talking about large-scale industry as he saw it at the time. Now look, it's 1941, he's looking mostly at, at war industry. Um, industry has become, I don't know, I don't know exponentially how much more large-scale than when he was writing, but 
I'm just going to say 100, if not more times. It's probably way more than that uh, in terms of, of large scale, transnational, global industries, right? But have you, wherever you are, thinking in a certain way? So, I mean, you know, like when you do call centers, you call and then you get rerouted somewhere, and people working there are taught to carry a conversation in a certain, a certain way using certain thought, and it's really hard to interrupt that thought, right? Because they have to have, they've got a certain script that they have to follow, even though the person is saying something else. It's like they just fit that into, that, that sort of global technological thought at the most, at the sort of lower level, at the service industry level. So in a sense, what Marcuse is saying is, in 1941, has been intensified immensely since then. So he says, mechanized mass production, that's about four lines down in the last paragraph of 158, is filling the empty spaces in which individuality could assert itself. The cultural standardized points, paradoxically being that to potential abundance as well as actual poverty. The standardization may indicate the extent to which individual creativeness and originality have been rendered unnecessary. With the decline of the liberalistic era, era these qualities are vanishing from the domain of material production and becoming the ever more exclusive property of highest intellectual activities. Now they seem to disappear from this sphere too. Mass culture is dissolving the traditional forms of art, literature, philosophy, together with the personality. So that, on the bottom of 158 there, that really is his critique both of technological rationality that, that drives industry and mass culture. And what he means by that is that we don't have time for critical thought. So his idea of critical thought is negative thought. He hasn't developed it here. He's, you'll notice he said the words critical thought about three times, and he hasn't told you what critical thought is. Um, he doesn't really work that out yet. Um, it's a negation, I mean, you will know when you're reading this, if you've read his other stuff, you'll go, oh yes, it's where he's working out, where he's gonna get to negative thought, thinking against the machine, thinking against the technological apparatus. It's what Heidegger would call reflective thought. Now he doesn't develop the sort of negative thought until 23 years later. But it's there sort of in, what do you call it? embryonic form in this piece. It's oppositional thought. It's thought that things against. So you can kind of glean from this piece that, that it's going to be, what he considers critical thought is going to be thought that things against what is. It's going to have at least two aims. It's going to aim to define the irrational character of the established reality which is his, what he's trying to do here. And because he's got a Marxist input, you could say, although I'm not expecting he would have got the second part of this, but the first part, you know, you probably, if you've read this, or even the excerpts I've read, you'll go, okay, well, one of the aims is to define the irrational character of reality as it exists, right? The second one is to hold on to the tendencies that cause this irrationality to transform the system. So it, it's really what people that now are called accelerationists would, would go with. And that is, it's, it's the tendencies that are going to bring down the system, to hold on to those, the tendencies that are critical of the system, the tendencies that, that extend it. So it's to define the tendencies which cause the rationality to generate its own transformation. The source of critical thinking for Marcuse is what he eventually calls a space for negative thinking. A space for negative thinking that's not stuck and fixed in the established technological rationality of society. It's very difficult to do, especially when you bring in the mass entertainment industry, and especially now when you also bring in, and I'm thinking of some of the work we do in cyber politics, but when you also bring in the fact that at an unconscious level we're hooked with our devices, that we think in a certain way along with the, the technological um, rationality of the devices we're using. And even though we've got creativity involved in that, it makes it more sort of effective at, a, at an unconscious level. So it's very difficult to get a space for negative thinking. And Marcuse argues 
At that point, but the space is dwindling. Now, you might want to argue that it's opened up, okay? I would also be happy with the other side of that argument, that it's, in a sense, we've got way more creativity. A lot of the creativity is hooked to technological rationality, but there is really an opening in art and philosophy for a sort of much bigger, a much bigger range. What distinguishes Marcuse's critique of technology from Heidegger's, and I think this is really important, is that he really infuses Heidegger's understanding of technology with Marx's categories. Marcuse is a Marxist. Heidegger read Marx for sure. He read the 1844 manuscripts. But Marcuse is a Marxist. You can see he's a, Hegel, he's a Hegelian Marxist in many cases. What that means is he sees technology as two things. He sees it as a means to an end and a human activity. He sees humans as having, quote, mastery of technology, being mastered of technology. So having mastery of technology on the one hand, and are in the position to be mastered by technology because they are a condition of possibility for the development of technology. So humans are both masters of technology and conditions of possibility for its development. He sides, in a sense, with um, Heidegger in terms of, of his idea of negative thinking, critical thinking, negative thought is a way of bringing forth to presence, to bring out of concealment. And it, his hope really is because he understands how humans co-present in the world, um, with the world and so with, with all the objects of the world, they co-present with it and that they have a dual role in technology. That is, they, they control it, they master it, and they're also a condition of possibility for it, that he sees a possibility for a change in a way of thinking. Now, he's not in favor. I mean, the mastery of technology means they develop it. That's kind of what he means by that. And the, the real problem then for Marcuse is that, that the technology that's being developed is hooked with a capitalist war economy. And, yeah, George. Does he ever give any kind of uh, breakdown or justification as to why he sees it as a perpetual war economy? Is that like an internal thing that he thinks is just attached to a capitalist mode of production? Uh, he thinks this, it, he actually thinks it is attached to a capitalist mode of production. Mm -hmm. That one of the big, um, and, and he was so far proved right, mm -hmm. uh, because one of the big, one of the big producers in today is war economy. Um, and, it, and so he's gone through World War I, he's in the middle of World War II, he's in America. What he's seeing is this booming war economy. He sees that that is really, it's really um, driving capitalism. And so yeah, and, and interestingly it still does, very much so. Um, where it's interesting for Marcuse is what he feels with technology. The idea that even though modern technology has developed in what he calls according to instrumental rationality, technological rationality, and it's developed in a mode of production that's a war economy that seems to go hand in hand with a particular type of capitalism, um, where he would see the possibility is in critical reflection of this. So once you get to a welfare state, he would see that as a possibility. I mean, he'd see lots of, of changes that, that could bring about change without bringing down capitalism and, and also with bringing it down like changing the mode of production. But oddly enough, or not oddly enough, the mode of production itself ends up being stuck in just an enhanced extension of a war economy. So did he still think that for the social democratic era? Did he think during the welfare time that it was, uh, you know, even though maybe there was a, uh, the imbalance was in favor of labor and in favor of, you know, socialist tendencies, that still there was a war economy yeah. in the background? He sure did, and especially he's got Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam's yeah, going exactly. on, yeah, right. So yeah, absolutely, Korea and then Vietnam. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because he was a part of the whole protest movement. Yes, he was. Yeah, and his theory was. I mean, that's that's when he. I mean, he was really old at the point where he became like the famous theorist, right? Um, and he would be out at protests and everything. He's a pretty interesting guy, and thinker, a very interesting thinker, that comes out of the comes out of the you know comes out of the tradition that we've gone through in modern political thought. And, and then, you know, Zizak is, is also used Marcuse, so he, he falls in that tradition, comes out of that tradition 
and uses it sort of against where it went, in a way. Um, Nietzsche, okay, second last lecture on us book Zarathustra. Zarathustra is aging even more. Um, and he's always caught, of course this is part four, he always, he's always caught between going back to the people and staying in solitude. And so where we find him at the beginning of part four, doing two things. One, he's out, he's at his cave, and he's out walking around in the mountains and woods, and he's, everybody he meets, he's inviting back to his cave. Because he's trying to see, he's out there searching for higher men. And he's not having much luck. Um, so the fourth part, interestingly, begins and ends with work. It begins with work on page 237 under the honey sacrifice, where he's asked, you know, what, what's your happiness? And Zarathustra says, what matters happiness? I've long ceased to be concerned with happiness. I'm concerned with my work. That's about three lines. And if you go to the very end, In the very end, and this is page, I'm not going to do that section, but I just want to take you there. 327, about the last five lines. Well, you know, he says, pity for the higher man's head its, at its time. He's like, his suffering, my pity for suffering, what does it matter? Am I concerned with happiness? I'm concerned with my work. So I think that's very, I found that I found that very interesting in, now his work is really attempting to change what Marcuse would call technological rationality, instrumental rationality, the way people think, and have them think differently. And you know, Zarathustra has, or Nietzsche through Zarathustra, has provided a pretty good critique of the state. He's provided a pretty good understanding of friend enemy. He's also now providing a really good critique of pity. So, First off, in front of his cave, Zarathustra encounters a shadow. And then he runs into the soothsayer, who alerts him that he's come to seduce Zarathustra to his final sin. And the final sin, then, is going to be pity, but it doesn't work. And during his walk, Zarathustra encounters these two kings that he's encountered before. So he's encountering the people again. He encounters the people who consider themselves higher men. He encounters the two kings who are clowns, and, with, and they have the worst thing to say about the people whom they call the rabble. So if you just back up to, I want, I want to read uh, quotes from both of those. So before encountering the kings, he's got the soothsayer. And that's on page 242. And the soothsayer says he's going to sit, it's under the cry of distress. You know, Zarathustra says, my final sin, which has been saved up for me, do you know what it is? Pity, answered the soothsayer. With an overflowing heart, he raised both hands. Oh, Zarathustra, I have come to seduce you to your final sin. And no sooner than this happens, there's a cry. And the soothsayer says, Zarathustra, there's a cry. Do you hear it? It's like, come, it calls you. Come, come, come. And the soothsayer says, it's time. It's high time. It's a higher man that cries for you. And then he says, you better dance unless you fall. So Zarathustra goes off. And the first one group he runs into are these two kings, 245, conversation with the king. And the kings, what they say about the rabble is a real comment, actually, on, I think, on how leaders and how monarchies see common people. Um, we've tried to get away from the rabble, all those scream throats, scribbling blue bottles, the shopkeeper's stench, the ambitious wriggling, the foul spew, few for the living among the rabble, few for representing the first among the rabble, nausea, nausea. What do we kings matter now? Um, and nausea, their old illness is upon them. They're sickened by the rabble. Then he comes to this leech, which ends up being called the great leech of conscience, um, which gets them to the magician, 
So I'm going to jump over the, the leech of consciousness because again, it's key. Um, and he gets into the magician who is masquerading himself as a moaning sick, sick man. If you go to page 251, the, the conscience says that, that basically his spirit demands that I know one thing and nothing else. Then if you go to the magician, um, the magician is rolling around, he's moaning, and Zarathustra recognizes the magician, doesn't show any pity for him, and says, you've harvested na nausea as your one truth. It's on page 256. You've harvested nausea as your one truth. And, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pity that. The aesthetic of the spirit, said the old man, I played him, this is a magician talking. Um, you yourself once coined this term, the poet and the magician, who at last turns the spirit against himself, the changed man who freezes to death from his own science and conscience. Then he gets, so he invites him. So Zarathustra has invited everybody to his cave. Then he gets to, because the magician has been searching for Zarathustra, so Zarathustra directs him and every other encounter to his uh, cave. He gets then to the old god. Now the old god is interesting. Um, and that's on, I think, it's probably one of the most under the section of retired, it's on page 259. The old god then is the old pope. And the pope, who's old, says the old god, which is the god of the Bible, is dead. That, you know, he's been out there seeking, it's on 259, I've been seeking the last pious man a saint, a hermit who lives alone in the forest and hasn't heard that the old god is dead. Doesn't know what the whole world knows today. And, and the Pope says what the whole world knows today is that the old god in whom all the world once believed no longer lives. And the old Pope is serving the old god to his last hour but he has no master. And he's been looking, he's been looking for the most pious of all, but he realizes the most pious of all has, has died. So then he says, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna seek another man. That's on page 260. I'm gonna seek another man. I should seek, my heart decided that I should seek another man, the most pious of all of those who don't believe in God. That I should seek Zarathustra. And Zarathustra says, well, you know, I'm Zarathustra. And he invites him. The Pope says to Zarathustra, you know how God died. This is where it gets interesting. You know how he died. It's true what they say. Pity strangled him. That he saw how man hung on the cross and that he couldn't bear it. That the love of man became his hell and in the end his death. That he died from pity. So which allows him then to say to Zarathustra, O oh Zarathustra on 262, with such disbelief are more pious than those that believe. He says, and I think this is an interesting clip for, for Nietzsche, he says, but some God inside of you must have, because of the pity of, of religion um, that Christianity teaches, that some God inside you must have converted you to your godlessness. And that's 262, and he says, the, the old Pope says, is it not your piety itself that no longer lets you believe in a God? And Zarathustra goes on, obviously inviting him. Um, but, but in a sense, he can't come because his grief and he doesn't have firm legs, etc. So. Then Zarathustra goes to what's called the ugliest man. And the ugliest man is in the valley of snake's death. And the ugliest man asks Zarathustra a riddle. It, what Zarathustra finds in this way, dead wasteland, he sort of pokes at it, it comes up from the ground, and 
it sort of speaks with girls, and it, and it, it, at last it becomes human, as a human voice and speech. And, he's, and, the, and the, the, this entity says, Zarathustra, Zarathustra, guess my riddle. And the riddle is, what is revenge against the witness? And the answer, is in this in the riddle is that the witness the revenge against the witness is pity you took revenge and Zarathustra says I recognize you well um, at first Zarathustra was, was struck by pity but then he stands up and he says he says but immediately Zarathustra rose from the ground and his face became hard I recognize you well he said in a voice of bronze you are the murderer of God. Let me go. You could not bear him who saw you, who always saw you through and through. You ugliest man, you took revenge on the witness. So the, the reason he's considered ugliest man is because the revenge is on the witness of those who realize that God doesn't exist. And Zarathustra says, you know, it's, it's their pity that I flee. And the ugliest man says, it's their pity that I flee. They persecuted me. Now you're my last refuge. And what Zarathustra does is he doesn't show him pity. Rather, he shows shame at this happening. So if you go to page 265. At the bottom there, what the ugliest man says, he says, pity is obtrusive, you, O Zarathustra. Whether it be God's pity or man's pity, pity offends a sense of shame. But today, pity is considered a virtue among all the little people. They have no respect for great fortune, for great ugliness, for great failure. So Zarathustra then also invites, invites him. However, he dies. When you get to the very end, what you get end of that section before they get to Zarathustra's cave. So what the last person shows Zarathustra is a man cannot bear that an all-seeing God should live. He invites the ugliest man to his cave and then he gets into doing. He says only the doer learns. He says to the, the man, Behold up there lies Zarathustra's cave. My cave is large and deep and has many nooks. Even the most hidden can find it, hiding places. He says, You don't want to live among man's pity, then do as I do. Learn from me. Only the doer learns. So then what it ends there is he's, it ends with action. The very last line the last two lines, now I found yet who despised himself more deeply. That too is a kind of height. Alas, he was perhaps the higher man of those whose cry I heard. So he's heard all these cries. The very last one, the ugly man who can't stand the pity of, of the masses, gets Zarathustra to say, I love the great despisers. And then he ends that chapter with, man, however, is something that must be overcome. You're gonna, next, what you're going to see is the voluntary beggar, the mel melancholy, and it's going to end with them all being in his cave, which I'll talk about next week. So it all kind of comes together there. So he's, he's really meeting representatives and people he's met before in search of the higher man. He's bringing them to his cave. And as he's going, he's, each one of them he kind of learns a lesson from. So what he learned from the last person was that, or which was once a person, was that pity is not, that, that it's very easy, okay, that it's easy to pity, but pity itself doesn't actually show shame for what has happened. I guess I put it that way. Okay, so it is 104. How about you come back at 120 and we've got four people presenting? Can you just put your hands up who's presenting today?
really get three people. Radhika, we've got Hasna. Uh, what's your name? Ah, yeah, Kenny. Okay, and there's one other person. Maybe they'll be here. Okay, so take take 15 minutes.